Hello again to all our listeners. This is DZPFP, and I am Stephanie Soares, your host. We are now on the third and final segment of Week 4, Part 2 of the Historical Background and Overview of Philippine External Relations. This time, we are on the cusp of Philippine independence and are about to take off on our adventure towards nationhood with the establishment of the Third Philippine Republic. Like before, we have our lecturer, Derek Atienza, to guide us through this process. Good day, Mr. Atienza. Uh, Good day to you, Stephanie. And hello to all our listeners. Glad to be here. So here we are, right around early 1946. The leaders of the Commonwealth of the Philippines and the U.S. officials led by prominent Democrat Paul V. McNutt on his second term as High Commissioner of the Philippines. Yes, interesting individual, Paul McNutt, who was actually the High Commissioner at the time Quezon proposed the rescue of persecuted Jews in 1938. And it was through his political connections that he managed to sidestep the State Department and get at least 1,200 Jews into the Philippines. I think you remember him from um, that film, Quezon's Game. Absolutely. By now, he's a supporter of Philippine independence. Yes, at the beginning, of course, he wasn't. Um, When he arrived in 1937, he was resolutely resolutely against it, reckoning that the Philippines was not prepared to defend itself. Of course, he was proven right in World War II, but that's beside the point now. So basically, with the return of the Americans in 1945, the schedule of the promise of independence was back on track. Senate President Manuel Rojas, who was designated successor to the presidency in case Quezon or Osmeña was captured or killed, called for a fresh fresh mandate for president, vice president, and legislators. Supported by MacArthur, Rojas beat Asmeña, thus becoming the third and last president of the Commonwealth, and at the same time, the first president of the newly independent Third Republic of the Philippines upon its inauguration on 4th of July, 1946, which, as you know, also happens to be Independence Day in the U.S., a choice that I'm sure wasn't entirely accidental. From the start, Ross was very pro-American. In his address, he stated among the main policies of his administration, closer ties with the United States and adherence to the newly created United Nations. He was controversial for strongly lobbying for and winning support in Congress, uh, which is dominated by his Liberal Party, for parity rights and the Belt Trade Act of 1946, which granted U.S. citizens and corporations rights to Philippine natural resources equal to or in parity with those of Philippine citizens, contrary to the 1935 Philippine Constitution, as a condition for um, the his new government to receive 800 million U.S. dollars in rehabilitation funds from the United States. Back then, they didn't even have to disguise this type of very unequal quid pro quo. And even back then, Um, It was an unpopular measure among um, Filipinos, and it it actually required a constitutional amendment, which was, of course, given by the political elite, especially uh, sugar barons in the Visayas. Um, They were were more than ready to give in to this demand in order to secure zero tariff in the export of sugar to the U.S., at least until 1954. In exchange, there would be no restrictions on the entry of United States products to the Philippines, nor would there be Philippine import duties. So it was so bad that in hearings before the U.S. Senate Committee in, on, on Finance, even Assistant Secretary of State for Economic Affairs, William Clayton, described the laws clearly inconsistent with the basic foreign economic policy of this country, of course referring to the United, United States, and clearly inconsistent with our promise to grant the Philippines genuine independence. Right-thinking Americans themselves thought it was unprincipled. Now, that's really bad. How could Filipino leaders sell the country out like that? Exactly. That's what I'm thinking myself. Apparently, it was McNutt and MacArthur who dictated such policies to Rojas, who was accused in some quarters as a collaborator with the Japanese. His willingness to accept any condition set by the U.S. for independence to the point of surrendering national sovereignty, including an agreement allowing the U.S. to set up Free, free of rent, 23 military bases in the Philippines for 99 years, won him support by the Americans, who even for a time wanted U.S. military bases inside what is now Metro Manila. Goodness, it's good that proposal didn't come to pass. Even now, I find it unthinkable why there should be Filipino military bases inside Metro Manila, much less foreign ones, 
No wonder we're often criticized for being subservient to the U.S. Rojas, in particular, was craven for his surrender of the country's freedom and its right to determine its own destiny. He was basically loyal to his own landlord class and didn't seem to care much for the plight of the majority of the poor. So, in so many ways, the actual achievement of independence was, as the Brits would say, a damp squib. It was definitely a disillusioning anticlimax. Which is sad considering that it was actually the first time the Philippines achieved recognition as an independent country from the global community of nations. Yes, but remember, even before independence, the Commonwealth of the Philippines won some kind of recognition already as an allied nation, even before independence, when it joined the anti-Axis alliance known as the United Nations on the 14th of June 1942. Of course, more people remember that than the so-called recognition of independence of the Second Republic by the Axis nations, Spain under the dictator Franco, Thailand, and Burma, as I mentioned in the previous segment. It's funny now, but it must have been mortifying back then. Laurel, in the meantime, had no choice but to declare his Second Republic ended by the time of the Japanese surrender in 1945, right? History is not finished with Laurel, though. Anyway, the point here is that Philippine independence in 1946 did not mean true independence in any sense. Many people argue that true independence has to be fought for and won, not handed on a, on a platter like Americans proudly say they did back then. So you will see that up to today, we are still fighting for true independence through our actions and decisions as a nation. It's an ongoing process, I guess, but perhaps it may be reflected in the way we keep on repeating that mantra of having an independent foreign policy because we've not really achieved it yet. What do you think? Most certainly, we had to claim our independence back from the U.S. one courageous act at a time. Many historians have noted how after independence, the U.S. continued to direct the country through the Central Intelligence Agency uh, or CIA operatives like Edward Lansdale who helped Ramon Magsaysay win the presidency, former New York Times correspondent Richard Bonner, who is famous for his book, Waltzing with the Dictator, noted that CIA agents also drugged sitting President Elpidio Quirino and discussed assassinating Nationalist Senator Claro Recto. One thing, though, that we have to credit Rojas for was at least he made sure that we were able to get back Turtle Islands and Mangsi Islands at our border with Malaysia. I've actually been to Turtle Islands um, in June 2013. It's at least 16 hours by ferry from Tawi-Tawi, the closest Philippine territory, but only 20 minutes by high-speed boat from Sandakan in Sabah. So to get to the Turtle Islands, six of which are Filipino and the remaining three are Malaysian, you have a choice between that 16-hour ferry or a flight to Singapore, then to Kota Kinabalu, and then a domestic transfer to Sandakan. Anyway, these two groups of islands, the Turtle Islands and Mangsi Islands, were agreed to be part of the Philippine archipelago under an international treaty concluded in 1930 between the U.S. and the U.K., which back then controlled the state of North Borneo. To cut a long story short, the two countries agreed that the British North Borneo Company would continue to administer the islands until the U.S. asked for them back. Well, surprise, the U.S. never really gave such a notice. So on 15th July 1946, the UK annexed the state of Borneo. Fortunately, someone did their homework and on the 19th of September 1946, the Philippines notified the UK that it wanted to take over the administration of the Turtle Islands, Tawi-Tawi, and Mangsi Islands, which we eventually did by 16th of October 1947. The question of Sabah was completely another matter, though, and we'll have a chance in the future to discuss that. Unlike the Commonwealth, the Republic now had a dedicated and professional foreign policy core, right? Oh, good of you to remind me. Yes, the Ross administration also pioneered the foreign policy of the Republic, appointing his Vice President Elpidio Quirino as Secretary of Foreign Affairs. As mentioned, the Philippines established diplomatic ties with foreign countries and gained membership to international entities such as the United Nations General Assembly, the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization, or UNESCO, the World Health Organization, or WHO, the International Labor Organization, ILO, etc. General Carlos P. Romulo, who was actually the last resident commissioner of the Philippines to the United States Congress from 1944 to 1946, 
served as Rojas' permanent representative uh, of the Philippines to the United Nations. And in for 1949, under Quirino, he was elected president of the fourth session of the UN General Assembly until 1950, the first Asian to hold that position. You've already discussed Carino, so are we done with Rojas? Uh, sorry about that. Yes, Rojas, um, notorious for his pro-U.S. sentiments, he died on American territory inside Clark Air Base, which he helped establish. You can't say that history doesn't have a sense of irony. Speaking of history, I mentioned earlier that it wasn't done with Laurel, who by the late 1940s was back in the Philippines from Japan. He challenged Quirino for the presidency the year after Ross's unexpected uh, death in 1949. And despite uh, apparently winning the popular vote, Laurel mysteriously did not contest Quirino's anomalous declaration of himself as the winner of the 1949 elections. Do you see the hand of a foreign power manipulating the outcome from the shadows here? Your guess is as good as mine. As dirty uh, his politics may have been, Quirino, the original Apo Lakai from Ilocos, was competent as president, managing well the post-war reconstruction, making a measure of economic gains, and scoring increased economic aid from the U.S. Of course, there was a problem of widespread graft and corruption, and he didn't make much headway in so resolving basic social problems. In fact, the Hukbalahap, the Hukbo ng Bayan Laban sa mga Hapon, which is a guerrilla unit uh, during World War II, the insurgency by the Hukbalahap worsened under the watch of Quirino. In foreign policy, though, he was very deft. In August 1949, for example, Quirino got together with South Korean President Tsing Man Di and Republic of China President Chiang Kai-shek, two other strongmen supported by the U.S., to agree to found the Asian People's Anti-Communist League, or APACO, in Jinhae, South Korea. I've actually been to the spot where the three leaders had held their talk um, in Jinhae, a district where the Republic of Korea Navy is based in in Changwon City, an hour from Busan, which is now famous for an annual cherry blossom festival in April. Anyway, at the time, in 1949, Chiang Kai-shek's forces were losing to the communist forces led by Mao Zedong in the Chinese Civil War, while South Korea was threatened uh, with attack from North Korea. So this APACO was formalized on 15th of June, 1954, holding its first general conference to advocate and support the causes of anti-communism, anti-totalitarianism, as well as anti-authoritarianism, -authori together with the heads of other states in attendance, including South Vietnam, Thailand, Okinawa, which is still under U.S. administration then, Hong Kong, and Macau. Then, with Romulo still sitting as U.N. Uh, General Assembly President, Quirino supported the call of the U.N. Sec Security Council to support South Korea against the invading troops of Kim Il-sung of North Korea. In September 1950, Quirino sent over 7,450 Filipino soldiers to Busan under the designation of the Philippine Expeditionary Forces to Korea, or PEFTOC. We were the fourth country to send troops and the first in Asia. Amazing! That's an impressive display of decisive leadership. It seems many countries looked up at Philippines for leadership back then. I guess, as UN founding member, we felt keenly a moral authority to uphold its principles. Plus, as a strong U.S. ally, we saw things as black and white as Americans did, who viewed communists unequivocally as evil and thus had to be stopped. So, foreign policy was really the strength of Carino's presidency. Yes, he was, after all, the first Secretary of Foreign Affairs under uh, an independent and internationally rec recognized republic. For that, he was called the father of the Foreign Service. But Quirino didn't make much of a difference in, in making the Philippines more independent than Rojas did. Remember, under Rojas, we just did what the U.S. told us to do in foreign affairs, inc including, for example, supporting the partition plan for Palestine, which Romulo, um, as um, the Philippine permanent representative, refused to do, and he was thus replaced. As for Carino, he accepted a set of proposals made by a U.S. economic mission to the Philippines, the Bell Mission, in 1950 to improve the Philippine economy, signing in effect an agreement with the U.S. representative, William C. Foster, to implement them in order uh, to receive development aid. Now, of course, the U.S. does this through the IMF. 
But as you can see, the U.S. pretty much had its way with the Philippines back then. That pretty much continued under the presidency of Ramon Magsaysay, right? Magsaysay was Quirino's defense secretary. He was a very popular president, but he was considered a close friend and supporter of the United States and a vocal spokesman against communism during the Cold War. Thanks to the support of the CIA, he managed to defeat the Hukba Lahap with the surrender of its leader, Luis Taruk, in 1954. Magsaysay also led the foundation of the Southeast Asia Treaty Organization, or CETO, um, as, and also known as the Manila Pact of 1954, which aimed to defeat Marxist-Leninist movements in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and Oceania. On trade policy, Magsaysay managed to replace the much-reviled Belt Trade Act with the La Laurel-Langley Agreement, which Uh, removed parity rights and extended market entry privileges for the Philippines in the U.S. until 1954. Magsaysay sent a delegation to participate in the Asian African Conference, which was held in Bandung in Java, uh, Indonesia, in April 1955. Initially reluctant at first, Magsaysay was convinced by Romulo to go to Bandung to stand by its interest against the cause of neutrality being pushed by many decolonized participating states. Now I find it ironic that the Philippines, which was even criticized for being an ally of the U.S. as a CETO member, that the Philippines thought it would be a good idea to essentially subvert the objectives of the Bandung Conference by going there. Lastly, Magsaysay was also able to achieve five years after the Japanese treaty was finalized in San Francisco in 1951, a reparation agreement with Japan in 1956, in which Tokyo agreed to pay the Philippines reparations for the damage it caused during the occupation of the islands. So, um, Magsaysay's four years as president was quite eventful. Sadly, he died in a plane crash on the way back from Cebu in 1957. So far, two out of the three presidents did not finish their term. Some people still consider the circumstances of the plane crash somewhat mysterious, no? Well, there are always conspiracy theorists in any era. So as Magsaysay's vice president, Mag Carlos P. Romulo took over and eventually he won his own four-year term in the elections that same year. Garcia promoted the Filipino first policy whose focal point was to regain economic independence. This was intended to be a national effort by Filipinos to obtain major and dominant participation in their economy. The administration campaigned for the citizens' support and patronizing Filipino products and services and implemented import and currency controls favorable for Filipino industries. Another achievement of the Garcia administration was the Bolin Serrano Agreement of 1959, which shortened the term of lease of the, Filip of the U.S. military bases in the country from the previous 99 years to just 25 years. While we don't normally hear much about Garcia, this particular agreement is crucial to one of the most decisive acts of Philippine independence from the United States, as we've seen uh, since 1946. That's a good point. But Garcia's successor did follow through on Garcia's Filipino first with a gesture of his own, right? Yes, the successor of Garcia was his vice president, Diosdado Macapagal, who ra ran under the Liberal Party in the 1961 presidential election. Macapagal achieved growth and prosperity for the nation, but he is best remembered for changing the date of celebration of Philippine independence from the 4th of July to the 12th of June. On 12 May 1962, Macapagal issued Proclamation No. 28 S1962, which declared the 12th of June as Independence Day. In 1964, Congress passed Republic Act No. 41. Uh, 4166, which formally de designated the 12th of June of every year as the date uh, on which we celebrate Philippine independence. There are, of course, a number of solid reasons why we still recognize the 12th of June as our Independence Day, even though not one country recognized the first Philippine Republic of Aguinaldo. The one that counted um, the most must have been the most personal, too. Makapagal told author Stanley Carnow that the reason for the change was that American embassy celebrations were visited more than the Filipino reception on the 4th of July, American Independence Day. In the field of foreign relations, Macapagal supported Southeast Asian regionalism when the Philippines became a founding mem member of Mafilindo through the Manila Accord of 1963. Mafilindo, which takes the first syllables of its member states as its name, 
Malaysia, Philippines, Indonesia, strove for Asian solutions by Asian nations for Asian problems, and aimed to solve national and regional problems through regional diplomacy. It was a great idea and was essentially a realization of Rizal's dream of uniting the Malay peoples, seen as artificially divided by colonial frontiers. Mafilindo was also intended to resolve controversies over the former British colonies of North Borneo and Sarawak joining Malaysia. But it didn't last as President Sukarno of Indonesia decided just one month later to oppose the creation of Malaysia through an undeclared war ca called in Indonesian language Konfrontasi. All the same, Mafilindo paved the way for new developments in the region which would later contrib contribute to the development of the country to what it is now. For the Philippines, it was able to quietly register its reservations to the inclusion of North Borneo, on which the Philippines had a standing claim, in Malaysia, which agreed to settle the matter at a future date. It was also during Makapagao's time that the Philippine government officially took on the claim over the territory of North Borneo from the heirs of Sultan of Sulu, Muhammad Esmail Il Kiram I, right? Yes, we can trace the assumption by the Republic of the Philippines, the claim of sovereignty over Sabah to 1962. We actually broke diplomatic ties with Malaysia and did not resume it until 1989. Makapagal's successor, Ferdinand Marcos, would attempt to withdraw that claim, however. You know, Marcos, he had grand ideas for the Philippines, but also an inflated idea of his own greatness and how the destiny of the nation was somehow tied to his own destiny. Just a year after becoming president, Marcos hosted the Manila Summit of 1966, which aimed to resolve the Vietnam War and sought the restoration of peace and promotion of economic stability and development throughout the Asia-Pacific region. In 1967, the Philippines joined four other countries in Southeast Asia, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and Thailand, to sign the ASEAN Declaration in Bangkok and create ASEAN. While it was not expressly one of the reasons for its founding, ASEAN was to serve as a bulwark against communist expansion in Vietnam and communist insurgency within their own borders. It also made up for the conflict among the Philippines, Indonesia, and Malaysia over Sabah and Sarawak. As ASEAN achieved greater cohesion in the 1970s, Marcos announced at the ASEAN summit on the 4th of August 1977 that the Philippines will take definite steps to eliminate one of the burdens of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, that is, the claim to the Philippine, of the Philippine Republic to Sabah. However, he did not follow through on that statement, despite negotiations and reassurances made by Marcos again in 1984 with Malaysian Prime Minister Mahathir Mohamad. Per the terms of the bolin serrano Agreement, Marcos negotiated and renewed the military basis agreement in 1979. People always portray Marcos as some kind of genius, but considering his extraordinarily long term in office, he's not really achieved much, has he? Well, that is such an accurate thing to say, in fact. Declaring martial law in 1972 and essentially terminating the 1935 uh, constitution in favor of one he had had drafted in 1973, Marcos did spend a lot of time trying to stay in power. But at the same time, we can also say that Marcos did have quite a number of foreign policy accomplishments, such as, for example, engaging China and the Eastern Bloc countries, even as the U.S. was making its own tentative steps towards China and detente with the Soviet Union. You see, the Philippines normalized ties with China in 1975, four years earlier than the U.S., and the Philippines established diplomatic relations with the USSR in 1976 after the um, defeat of the United States in Vietnam. That same year, Marcos also managed to convince Libya to withdraw support for Nur Miswari, the leader of the Moro National Liberation Front, through the Tripoli Agreement signed in December 1976. In exchange, the Philippines and MNLF agreed to define autonomous administrative divisions for Muslims in the southern Philippines, the establishment of an autonomous government, judicial sy system for Sharia law, and special security forces, and the observance of a ceasefire. When his government's actions fell short of his promises, the peace pact collapsed and hostilities between the MNLF and the Philippine government forces resumed. In 1981, Marcos lifted martial law throughout the country, marking the beginning of a new or Fourth Republic of the Philippines. 
With the assassination of Nino Aquino in 1983, however, the Marcos administration slowly became isolated diplomatically so that at the time of the February 1986 People Power Revolution, the U.S. quietly withdrew its recognition from his government in support of Cory Aquino and facilitated Marcus, Marcus's departure from the country in order to prevent bloodshed. And so, the Fourth Philippine Republic ended with the fall of Marcos in February 1986. That event essentially ushered in the current Fifth Republic, where we are now at. Yes, I would say that is the contemporary period of the Philippines, even though for many of our listeners, they were not even born back then. But I think as a survey of historical events, we can probably end here. We can discuss the foreign policies of the succeeding presidents, Corazon Aquino, Joseph, uh, Fidel Ramos, Joseph Estrada, Gloria Macapagal Arroyo, Benigno Aquino, and Rodrigo Duterte more as contemporary events. I suppose it's fair to say that, as we are in many ways taking stock of the actions and decisions made after the 1986 restoration of democracy in the Philippines. Yes, there are a lot of things to discuss for the future, so this is probably a good time to end this current lecture as any. With that, dear listeners, I would like to encourage you to ask any questions covering both week 3 and week 4 at the next synchronous session next week. Until then, take care and stay safe.